present everywhere and fills all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, so gracious one. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to the catechism class. I believe this is the third, part three of uh, the, the lecture parts. Um, the syllabuses that I, the syllabi that I um, sent out had church tour on part of it, but that's kind of more of a live experience thing. So uh, hopefully those of you who are in or on the island uh, at the end, if uh, maybe we can uh, meet after church sometime and do the, do the church tour in the church uh, so we can take care of part one at the end. This evening, we are looking at uh, what we believe about the saints and the Theotokos, what we believe about eschatology and life after death, and what we believe about the sacraments. That's a lot of information. I am going to be um, just giving you little snippets here and there of things. Uh, those, those subjects individually could, could take uh, several well, several months of hours of classes just on those alone. I believe that um, Father Cognaris gives a good explanation of them in the book. I'm just going to add a few things here and there, um, some notes for our edification. And of course, if you have any questions, you can feel free to unmute and, and or to write them and I will see them on the on the side of the screen here. Thank you. What we believe about the saints and the Theotokos. The saints are those who actually are seen as a reflection of Christ, that Christ is shining through their lives. And of course, the Theotokos is the one from, from whom the Lord took flesh and is a prime example of the saints as those who love God selflessly and surrender their will to his. As the Virgin Mary said, not my will, but thine be, but God's, God's will be done. So when we look at the saints, we have to also look at the word saint. The word saint in the West comes from the Latin sanctus, which is of course, it has the, the sense of sacred, and that is also a related word. This is a, a, a word of Latin origin. They say it goes back to a particular uh, Hittite ritual called the Sakr, and that that's where the word sa sacred came from. In the Greek language, the word is agios, and it's the same as holy. Agios can be a reference to things that are not the saints, such as the Holy Bible, the Holy Cross, a holy place, a holy building, a holy purpose, something like that. But it is also the word simultaneously for saints. So agios means that which is not worldly or that which is set apart. And this goes back to the Hebrew word Excuse me a moment. It's a little too loud. Korea. Sorry, she's distracting me with a phone call. Um, Kadesh, uh, which is when we look at, at the, I believe, the prophecy of uh, either Isaiah or Ezekiel, where we see the angels circling the throne of God, we hear them saying, holy, 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 Lord Sabaoth. Now, that word also means set apart. And I believe I may have described this in an earlier session. It's where we take a loaf of bread and we knead the dough and we roll it into a cylinder because that's how they would bake bread, as in cylinders of dough. But often the ends would be crumpled and pointed and not look so good if we were to leave them on the loaf of bread when we bake it. So they would cut them off 
and they would set them aside for a different purpose. And they would add honey to them, and they maybe put something like raisins in them or something like that to make a sweet cake. And those that was something which was considered set apart. And so the word holy brings to mind that part of the bread which was set apart for another purpose, a purpose that was the dessert, so to speak. So when we look at the word holy, we're also looking at this. But the saints have different titles. They also have specifically, most for the most part, the Old Testament saints are called vikei, or right, which is often translated as the righteous. So you'll hear about righteous Abraham, or righteous Moses, or righteous the righteous prophets. This is what we usually use in the Greek is vikeos to describe those people that were before Christ. And it also is uh, one of the title, some of the titles of the New Testament saints as well, but very rare. Then we have a word that means worthy to be called holy, which is maybe a little bit higher in rank. And that in Greek was osios, uh, the holy fathers of the church. Sometimes they're referred to as osi pateres, that is worthy to be called holy fathers. When a person dies and we speak of them of blessed memory, we also call them makarios, okay? And generally that, that is translated blessed or happy. The word makarios is related to the Hebrew word asher or name asher. Uh, it's the first word in Psalm 1 verse 1, asher or makarios, meaning both blessed and happy. Again, that is what we generally call people who have passed from this life into the next, and we consider them to be good people. So those are the basic titles or name, or excuse me, words that we attribute to the saints. There is also one that means precious or highly venerable, and that is Timios. Um, Timios generally means honorable if we're going to translate it into English, but it is a, a, a title that is specifically given to St. John the Baptist and is also specifically a title given to the Holy Cross. The Holy Cross obviously is not a saint, it's a, a thing, but because of God's grace working through it, we consider it to be powerful and so it is called tutimio stavru or the honorable or precious cross now we do have saints beginning with the old testament and even we consider adam and eve because they repented and turned back to god we consider them as well among the saints obviously there is even before the flood a prophet named enoch who we are told was taken up into heaven, that one day he was walking and then he was not found because God took him. And it is the belief of the church as well, I believe in Judaism as well, that the prophet Enoch was assumed dead into heaven bodily and has not gone through physical death, at least as of yet. There are some stories, um, traditional uh, teachings, that both Enoch and later the prophet Elijah, who was also taken up bodily into heaven and did, and did not die yet, will come back to preach the second coming of Christ and will eventually be martyred uh, shortly before the Lord's return. But we also consider people like Noah and Abraham and Sarah, and Isaac and Rebecca from the Old Testament to be saints. And we go forward, uh, Moses and Aaron and Miriam, their sister, and Joshua and the ver and various of the judges of Israel and the early prophets. Of course, Ruth 
is interesting because she was not a, an Israelite, and yet she is also considered among the saints. Job, likewise, although he may have been a descendant of Abraham, he was not an Israelite, and he is also considered a saint. We have the book of Job, of course, in the Old Testament. And, of course, we have the prophets, uh, a number of the saintly kings, David, Solomon, and, and Helechias, uh, who were saintly kings in the Old Testament. And there were also figures between the Old and the New Testament. We have books on the Maccabees and the Maccabean uh, revolt. And uh, Judas Maccabeus was one of their great leaders. He was also numbered among the saints in the Orthodox Church. So we do have even what at least Protestants would call intertestamental saints, that there is a continuous line, a continuous lineage of saints given to us every generation. Uh, whether we know their names or not, we believe that God has, has given us, by his grace, saints in each and every generation up until even today. But let's go to the New Testament. Of course, the New Testament also it is a book that gives an account of many of the saints of that of those days. St. John the Baptist, of course, uh, Joseph and the Virgin Mary are mentioned in the, in the New Testament. The Twelve Apostles, James the brother of the Lord, and uh, Jude, Luke, Mark, Paul, Stephen, Lydia, Titus, Philemon, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, Quartus of Beirut, various other uh, saints are named. Some of them just are named in passing. Paul references to them as, references their names as his friends and says, give greetings to Apollos and Nicanor and so forth. And many of those are actually uh, saints in the church. And we the church has preserved histories outside of the New Testament that tells their story. In fact, in the book of Revelation, one of the early martyrs named Antipas of Pergamum is mentioned by name, and he is mentioned as a martyr, one who had given his life for Christ. So the New Testament also, as well as the Old, names various individuals that we would consider saints. And why do we consider them saints? Because in the Old Testament, they are prophetic of Christ coming into the world. And in the New Testament, they are glorified by their imitation of Christ and by receiving Christ's message in their lifetimes. And we have the saints that followed them, the, the men and women that glorified God in the early church, that many of them were martyred, many of them uh, de de dedicated everything in their lives to Christ and the gospel. And we have their histories, not in the Bible, of course, but in the early literature of the church. And we see in them a mirror of Christ, a reflection of Christ in the world, and in their lives, a fulfillment of Christ's prophecy. Christ said, of course, if you love me, the world will hate you. And naturally, uh, those saints that were martyred in very uh, grisly and brutal ways uh, are very very much fulfilling that prophecy of Christ and are worthy of memory, worthy of note, worthy of being called saints in the church. And this happens to this day. We are still in the age, unfortunately, of martyrs. And for some of the people, uh, I know Sam comes from Egypt, Osama, uh, he his people have seen waves of persecution from the beginning, from, of course, the Greco-Roman Empire from the time of Christ. Christians were persecuted in Egypt. There were various waves of persecutions through the time of Diocletian, at least. Uh, when Emperor Constantine uh, embraced the faith in Rome, it did not end the martyrdom for Christians. Christians were still living in Iran, which was a Zoroastrian or uh, Mazdayaznian nation, and Christians were persecuted there. Islam also 
has persecuted Christians in different waves and different periods of history. And that's very much true of Egypt, unfortunately, even to this day. It seems, however, that God has preserved the, the Christians of those lands when people rise up, when ideas when, uh, become common that the Christians should be either forced to be converted or killed, something happens. In Egypt, a number of appearances of the Virgin Mary took place over Coptic churches, which were noted and considered to be legitimate apparitions of the Virgin Mary, even by the Muslims themselves, which caused the Muslim fundamentalists to back off and not to persecute the Christians there. So there is persecution. There was persecution. There probably most likely will be persecution moving forward. But at various times and seasons, God has manifested his glory among Christians to protect us from those who would have otherwise destroyed us entirely. And this brings me back to one of the miracles that I did not account for uh, last week. Samantha asked about um, why miracles don't occur today as they did in the past. And I quickly said, <laughs> well, actually they do. And I failed to, to mention one of the most remarkable miracles that I have heard at least um, in the past 15 to 20 years. And it, it occurred within 15 to 20 years ago, perhaps, perhaps um, more like 15. This occurred in Syria. And I, but I'll begin with the story because that's not where the story begins. The story begins actually in, uh, I believe, Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. There was a couple, Muslim, that got married and they had difficulty having a child. And after 10 years and of seeing doctors and getting advice from people all over the world, the, the end result was that they still didn't have a child and it seemed impossible. Now, the parents of the groom said to their son, take another wife and keep, keep your first wife as prime, your prime wife, but have children by a second wife, which he didn't want to do. So in order to get away from the depression of it, he took his wife to Syria and they had a personal driver take them around and look at the look at the countryside, the various sites, and the ancient ruins and so forth. But at times the, the driver would see them weeping in the back seat. So he finally stopped thinking that it was his fault. And he said, look, I don't want you to cry. It's. I'm, I'm here to take you wherever you want to go. And if, if you want to go somewhere and, and I fail to do so, you just need to tell me and we'll turn around and we'll go there. Of course, uh, that wasn't the reason why they were crying. So they confided in him their story, told them what had happened to them and why they were coming to visit. And he quickly thought of this monastery where he said there was a painting of Mary of the Christians. And if someone were ta to take the wick from the oil lamp that was burning on it and, and to eat it, that Mary of the Christians would grant them their wish. This was his kind of Aladdin and, and, and the magic lamp kind of mentality that he had. That's not what was going on. But the, yes, there were miracles. There were wonders occurring at this monastery and before this icon, but it wasn't as he was saying. But they got excited and they said, sure, take us to the monastery. So he went to the monastery and they got out and they went into the monastery and they lit, lit candles and said prayers. And the, uh, the monastic people in there spoke with them and gave them encouragement that within a year they would have a son. So they were all happy when they came out and, and just giddy. And the man said to uh, his driver, if, 
if I have a son in one year, I'm going to bring back $80,000 and I'm going to give it to the monastery and I'm going to give you 20000 just for being there. So they go back home and within a year they have a healthy baby son. So the man feels he has to go back to Syria to, to make good on his promise. So he has a uh, briefcase, I guess, full, full, full of $100,000 in American dollars, $100,000 briefcase. And he goes back to the, to the airport in, in Syria when he lands and calls the man and asks him if he remembers him. And he says, yes, he remembers. And he says, well, I'm here to, to make good on my word. So the man comes to pick him up. And he has two other guys, two of his friends in the car. And, of course, the the father of the newborn baby is so happy. He says, I'm going to just for being there, I'm going to give you 10,000 each. So they go driving off. And instead of taking him to the monastery, they drive him out into the desert. And they take him out of the car and they kill him. They cut off his head. They cut off his arms and his legs. And they put the, the remains in the back uh, trunk of the car and now they have all of his money and his rolex his id everything they have and they head back out to the highway and the car breaks down and someone driving by wanting to give them help stops and they ask walks up walks up to them they're looking at the the motor trying to figure out how to get things started again and he asks him do you need any help and they say, no, no, everything's fine. We, we, we can handle it. No problem. So he goes back to his car. And as he's going back to his car, he sees the blood dripping from the back trunk. And he thinks probably something like, hey, these guys are poachers. They've killed an animal out here. And now if I'm, if I'm seen with them, I'm going to be implicated. So he immediately went to the police and told them that he had seen such and such. And the chief of police and two other two other groups of police officers get into three three squad cars and they go out and they surround the car. They haven't gotten the motor started yet. They, so they surrounded the car and the chief of police asks them for the keys to the back trunk. So they give him the keys to the back trunk and he walks around and he's about to stick the key into the hole when he hears from inside the back trunk. Don't you know, wait. She's not finished yet. And they're looking at each other like, what's going on here? This is very strange. And then finally, he says, you can open the trunk. The guy, the man from inside. So they, he opens the trunk and the man's kind of in fetal position and he starts moving and he, he stands up and he has these sutures around his neck and his arms and his legs. And he says, Mary of the Christians just sewed me back together and with the help of her son raised me back to life. So the men that had killed him insisted that he, sh he, he should be dead and they kind of lose their minds and become very irrational. The policemen uh, put them in handcuffs and send them to an asylum because they're really out of their minds at this point. And they take the man to a doctor, of course, because he's covered from head to, to foot with his own blood. And the doctor freaks out because he sees the sutures are more precise than anyone could have done in Syria. So he's he's thinking maybe these got the, this man has been brought from an American facility where some super high tech uh, experiment has been done on him, and, and the sutures were put in by 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 this me some method. And he insists he wants to know what's going on, where, where, where the man came from. He starts yelling at the police. So the police whisk the man away, take him down to the police station, and they write the deposition in the man's own words of what had happened to him. And this, at first, when I heard it, I thought this doesn't sound right. And even the person that sent it to me said, don't circulate it among others because it may, because even she thought that it was possibly um, 
someone trying to demean or to, to trick Christians into thinking that this was true. But it was apparently uh, first disseminated by the Brotherhood of uh, the, the Holy Sepulchre, which is in Jerusalem. And I knew people from Jerusalem. And I also knew people from Lebanon who were very religious and very well plugged into what's going on. So apparently there was a letter out there of the of the archbishop, or excuse me, the patriarch of Antioch, who had who had who had put a stamp of approval that this was a legitimate miracle, and I saw that on the on the internet too. But that could that could be forged as well. And I also had friends from Syria, so I asked all of them, "Have you heard this story, and is it true?" And the first thing they asked me was, "Where did you hear that?" And the second thing they to told me was, yes, it is true. So now I'm beginning to think, hmm, what's going on? The people in from Palestine, obviously, they're, they know the monks that disseminated the information, but that they're not liars. The people from Lebanon also, they had people all over the Middle East. They knew that the, Ant the patriarch of Antioch did actually write that letter. But the clincher for me was that some the friends of ours from Syria said that his cousin, his his cousin, was a reporter who had interviewed that chief of police on TV, and that this was act. This is true. This is like the real thing. So after that, I I said okay. Still, it sounds too good to be true, but. Apparently it is, and it's been spread to Greece. It's been translated. The, the story was translated into Greek, and the man said, when I was still a Muslim, this happened to me. So obviously he converted to Christianity. The end of the story actually is goes that instead of, instead of the $80,000, he took $800,000, and he called his wife and baby to come up to Syria as well, and they all went out and gave the monastery $800,000 rather than $80,000, and that apparently they moved to Greece to escape the possibility of being killed, because obviously um, converting from Islam to another religion you know, usually facilitates the death penalty against you, if not from your own relatives, from other Muslims. And but nevertheless, uh, this was a very apparently a very wealthy family uh, that and, and this happened to them. Be that as it may, that's one of the modern stories. We don't say he's a saint. Um, he hasn't. I don't. We don't. I, he still is incognito. His they don't. They didn't publicize his name probably for his own safety. But apparently, this is a true story. I'm. I'm pretty shocked, but what can we do with it? But there are fantastic things going on. And the Lord said that you will see greater things than these. So apparently that's what we're seeing. This ha this story has more to do with, the, with part two of today's uh, class about what we believe about eschatology and life after death than it does to do with the saints. But nevertheless, it is one of those stories that makes you say, hmm. Okay, let's go on. The Bible itself has set the precedence for the remembrance of the saints. And in the icons, we have saints depicted in Christ's image. They're not photographs. This is why in the icon, we see kind of the same looking faces. It's supposed to be actually the face of Christ in that person. That is to say, that person lived a life in Christ, or perhaps near the end of their life, they repented and became Christ-like at that moment, or went through suffering and torment for the sake of Christ, and thus are a reflection of him. When we look at the saints, then, we're not 
We're not saying that they are a distraction from Christ. They should never be a distraction from Christ, but rather a magnification of him and of his teachings and how he has impacted their life and their behavior. The saints then point us to Christ. They magnify him. They glorify him. And in a sense, they reveal him again. They also sanctify in Christ the positions and the professions that they hold. We have a number of books out there that mention patron saints. And there's one in particular um, I I'll have to get it to you later if you're interested in it. There's one in particular that goes by a very long list of various uh, professions, places, uh, needs, where a patron saint is listed. We don't really, that's not really that popular in orthodoxy to make it that scientific and that like that focused. Um, but there, there have been some some books in modern times written on patron saints of particular things that that look like big grocery lists um again it's interesting but it's not necessarily the orthodox i wouldn't say that that's really the orthodox approach we're more organic when it comes to the saints and to uh, our needs we always are always are asking christ uh, we may ask the saints to intercede for Christ, be, before Christ, for certain things. Um, indeed, there are particular saints that are known for being intercessors for uh, for one affliction or another. Saint Paraskevi, for example, who whose eyes were taken out and then were restored, is a patroness of those who have vision problems and and for those who. Uh, are, are seeking healing from blindness, that sort of thing. So there are some saints like that. When we look at Orthodox Judgment Day, we believe that we will be judged according to our own actions and according and that uh, that our whatever we did in life will have somewhat well let's use the term a ripple effect. For example, St. Paul, who gave us the, the predominant number of, of books or letters of the New Testament, has had a major impact, a major impact on Christianity. His explanations of the faith, his experiences, his admonitions to his spiritual children, have become for us, even in our times, something of a life-changing uh, advice. And so when we look at the impact of St. Peter, excuse me, St. Paul, St. Paul had an impact in his own generation, but continues to have an impact in every Christian generation until today and well into the future. So we will be judged on those kind of things, not just what we do, but the impact of what we have done and whether that is beneficial to the faithful, beneficial to the church, beneficial to the message of Christ in the world. We do not look at the saints as paganism looks to the gods or like popular kind of folk Buddhism looks to particular Buddhas that we go to a that we we don't go to a particular saint and that we will get our way that we get something that we want. Yes, we can make petitions, we can ask, but remember, generally, we should not be asking for something that is not edifying. Just because we want to be wealthy doesn't mean that God's going to give us wealth. Just because we want to be successful in some worldly pursuit does not mean that God is going to give us success. Perhaps success will not be edifying to our soul in that respect. So we have to keep in mind that God wants to do what's best for us. Not We can't manipulate him to do what we want for us, 
but God will always be trying to do what is best for us. And that may be that might seem strange in some cases where why is it that some people become very sick or sometimes an entire family becomes sick from various different uh, things. One has cancer, one has heart disease, one has an injury, another gets in a car accident, etc. all at the same time. Why is that? Well, if they're a family that doesn't go to church, maybe God is trying to get, to show them something. Maybe God is trying to to rattle their cage and wake them up and say, hey, you're neglecting something that's important. And this is my wake up call to you. Unfortunately, some people don't understand. And instead of those kind of tragedies bringing them closer to God, they actually move further away. But in the end, we can say God did his part. And unfortunately, they did not respond properly. The Virgin Mary, we have to understand, is fully like us. We don't say that she was born without sin, as the modern Roman Catholic theology has developed. We do not believe really in the same sense of the fall. So really that, that issue hasn't come up. But Christ assumed what he came to save. And if he did not assume fallen human flesh, then he did not save fallen human flesh. In other words, if Christ were born unfallen, then he, then he assumed an unfallen flesh, then he came to save those who were unfallen. And that's none of us. Unless, it's, unless in the Roman Catholic theology, it's his mother. Only she would be saved. But we say that even the Virgin Mary was subject to aging and death. And it was necessary for Christ to come in the world, even to save her. We don't really feel, we didn't really develop the theology along the lines that, oh, she had to be very pure because Christ could not have been born into the world unless he, he came through a very pure vessel. Well, by the same token, uh, the Orthodox reply, Christ did not come into the world through a tube. He came into the world and he assumed our flesh, human flesh. He became one of us and was therefore the savior of those whom he called his kinsmen, which is all of us. He became a human being through the Virgin Mary. So we, we, we avoid that belief that the Virgin Mary was somehow conceived without sin or was unfallen, which even makes which even makes um, marital copulation somehow dirty and and seem somehow part of the fallen nature. Orthodoxy did not say that. We don't we don't go that as far as that to say that um, that sexual relations between a husband and wife, are bad. Actually, we say that that's a good thing. That's actually a sacred thing because through that, human life is produced. Another soul comes into the world. A baby is conceived. That is a holy act, and we participate with God in creation through that act, okay, as a man and wife. But it is so holy, it is such a sacred thing that it should only be done between husband and wife. So that is our approach, not that it's dirty and it's fallen and that that a husband and wife can, but it's only a dispensation. That's not that is not the Eastern belief. We believe, I think, as the Jewish belief, Jewish Jews also believe that that is a sacred act, a sacred act of creating another human being and a form of intimacy that brings uh, a husband and wife closer together and binds them together. And, and so we have a very positive uh, view of that. And unfortunately, uh, the Western churches moved away from that, that early belief from the church. Now, again, we come to words. Words are very important because when we talk about 
our relationship with the saints, just as when we talk about our relationship with the icons or the gospel book or with uh, showing showing respect to the priesthood, not necessarily the priest, but the priesthood, the ierosini, the ordination, by kissing the hand of a priest, that all of those signs of respect are called veneration in the in the Greek language, proskinesis, okay, or adoration. Proskinesis is different from the word latria. Latria is the Greek word that has to do with our relationship with our God. So this is this is what makes a statue and an idol different. A statue can be a statue of a human being, a statue of a saint. It's not a God to us. It is not a God to us. But when the statue represents a God other than God, that becomes a, an idol from the word idol and latria. Idol latria, idolatry. Okay, so latria is the relationship that we have with God. Idolatry is a relationship that someone might have with an idol that they believe to be a god. Okay, so the generally in English we will say veneration, and uh, latria really doesn't have a proper English translation, and that's why we get confused in English between uh, what what we're doing. Latria is, is a relationship. It's not an external thing. It has nothing to do with bowing down or kissing or showing respect or bowing our heads. It has nothing to do with that. Latria is our relationship with God. That is our God. All the other words that we have, though, that kind of take the place, worship, veneration, adoration, those are words that describe an external sign of bowing down and showing respect and so forth. So we confuse in English latria with proskinesis, obviously two very different sounding and different meaning words in Greek. But in English, it's blurry. It's blurry because we don't have the proper word for latria. And so we use words like veneration and adoration and worship for it. But if you look up those words, they all have the, the meaning of an external sign of bowing down, of showing some physical sign of respect. So when we kiss icons or we kiss the hand of the priest or bishop, that is proskinesis. Okay, it's it's a sign of respect and veneration ultimately to the one whom we represent not us okay so you call you when you refer to me as father you're not you're not doing that as a sign of respect for me you're doing it as a sign of respect for the ordination which came from Christ or you're reminding me of my responsibility as a father to you because those kind of things of respect only should go to God. That's what God, that's what Christ meant when he said, call no man father, call no man rabbi, call no man teacher. Okay. In other words, you don't use those titles for men to respect them. But elsewhere, Paul says, you have not many fathers in Christ. I am, I've, I've been a father only to a few. And also um, there's a, I think it's in one of the Tim Timothy, first or second Timothy, uh, it speaks of, in English, it says, do not admonish your elders or elder men, um, but rather address them as fathers. And do not uh, admonish your older, the older women, but, at, at, but, but address them as mothers. Well, the word for older men is presbytery, which 
word is my title, the title of the, the leader of the Christian community. And pres, presbyter, presbyteros became prester, became priest. So the word priest actually is related to the word presbyteros, which is used in Timothy, and that says, don't admonish your presbytery, but refer to them as father. So there it says literally. And the pres and the women that were older, they're called presbyteras. That's the title of my wife. Okay, so the the wives of your presbyter, the wives of your elders, the, the women of higher rank. Presbyteros or presbytera means higher rank, person of higher rank. And the, that would be the leader of the Christian community. The local leader is me. And I am a presbyteros. You would refer to me as a father. You would refer to my wife, the older, the women like that, as mother. Interesting enough, uh, in Greek, they say presbytera which is the specific title in Greek. But in Russia, they actually do call the presbytera, the priest's wife, matushka, which means, well, it, it sounds kind of funny, but it means big mama, it means like it, like the, the, the mother of, of high, of the mother of mothers, the high ranking mother of the community. So it's interesting that that verse was, interpreted when it was written into English and they they left out the fact that presbyteros is actually priest and presbytera is actually the wife of the priest yet those are the words that were in the original Greek so there there are some issues with the English texts and there that and uh this is not going to be the only instance that I will bring this up but the difference between showing respect, outward signs of respect to the icons or to the saints or to the priests is not a relationship with them that you have with God. The relationship that you have with them is God, with God is a separate thing. And we don't have the word for latria, but, but that's what it is in Greek. So unfortunately, as I said, English doesn't really convey that nuance that difference are there any questions about that no oops okay we'll go on then we also have among our saints the respect of relics that is the remains of a saint and this began very early on with and we have the earliest reference to the taking of the of the saints relics going to St. Polycarp. St. Polycarp was a disciple of St. John that wrote the Gospel of St. John and the Apocalypse, the, the Book of Revelation, and the three letters of John. That John's spiritual disciple was named Polycarp. And Poly when Polycarp died, we have this record of the Christians gathering up his remains because he was martyred. They gathered up his bones and his remains remains, excuse me, as if they were precious pearls and diamonds. And they they brought them to a place where they could respect them and to show respect to them. And so we have from the very earliest days, just right after the, the, the days of the apostles, this reference to the respect of the remains of the saints. In fact, we refer not only to the remains of saints as relics, but even to the remains of any Orthodox Christian who has died. We refer to their remains as relics or lipsana. And this is, I think, a very important issue because, again, it goes to the second section of tonight's thing. Hopefully I can get to that quickly. Um, that we, our bodies die and sleep so to speak but they will be reawakened in the resurrection and they will be changed they will be transformed into spiritual bodies and so that's why in expectation of the general resurrection we look at the the, the bodily remains of all orthodox christians as if they are relics and we treat them with the same respect and that's again one of the reasons why we don't uh, believe in cremation because cremation is not just burning the body, but actually 
anything that's left that's hard because most of the bones don't burn. The bones have to be ground very violently into powder. Okay, it is not, it's not that you go into uh, an oven and come out a nice pile of ash. That's not what happens. You have to be ground up, physically ground up into powder. That's what happens in cremation. And that is against the hope of the resurrection. That, that appears to actually go contrary to the hope and the belief that we will be raised again and that what we have in this body will be changed into spiritual bodies at the Lord's return. So when people say, I'm not a saint, that might be true, but it should be, I'm not a saint, but I'm trying. Okay, so we should all try to be on that path. And when we think of it as being so impossible and so difficult to acquire and so difficult to achieve, we don't really realize how many millions and perhaps even uncountable numbers of people are actually saints that have been from the time past and that might even be in this very day. So it doesn't really give us ex an excuse. We still must strive. We still must continue to prepare ourselves for the general resurrection when we will receive those spiritual bodies and we will be like the saints. In fact, the early, in the early church, St. Paul refers to his brothers and sisters in the Christian faith as saints, the body of Christ being set apart from the world. We are those who are set apart. We are called to be different. We are called not to go like sheep, like mindless sheep and follow the flock over the hill and over the cliff. We are called to be rational sheep of the Lord and to be the ones that follow his voice and not, not worldly voices that would say things contrary to the teachings that we find in Holy Scripture. And this is what we call theosis, kind of the meaning of life for Orthodox Christians to participate in God's divine energies or to participate in his divinity, so to speak. Now, are there any? Oh, sorry. There is a story from, I believe, Ethiopia of us, of um, one of the martyrs that was, he was burned and he was crushed and he was, he was uh, ground to powder and he was scattered among the wind. And uh, one of the later kings whose ancestors had done this to the saint met a living saint of the day. And he said to him, if if your God is the God of the resurrection, then bring back this man that was cremated and and ground to dust and scattered to the wind. And the man knelt down and prayed, and there was a great whirlwind, and sand and ash came out of the air, and the man reassembled before the king. <laughs> now that's pretty that's pretty fantastic miracle story in and of itself. And and another one that that makes you scratch your head and say. Hmm, I don't know about that, but the story goes that this actually um, led to the king's conversion. Obviously, he saw it happen in front of his eyes. Um, there are those among the saints who obviously, not according to their last will and testimony, were cremated. And we don't have any of their remains. They were scattered. Um that is not their that was not their choice that was not their desire yet it happened and we do revere them as saints and we do believe that god's power which is omnipotent can reassemble them on the day of the resurrection now there are those i and i've done some services for those who were married to people who were not orthodox christians and they didn't have anything clear in their will about what was to be done with their bodies after death. And their non-Orthodox spouse decided on their own to cremate them. Um, again, that was not their choice. 
Uh, there are, I, I also know some people who actually did make out a will and did request that their bodies be buried with a proper Orthodox Christian ceremony and buried, not cremated. And the, the spouse uh, chose not to respect their will and had them cremated anyway. So it does happen uh, on, on unfortunate circumstances. Some people are ignorant and they don't know it. They, they have not heard, they've not gone to catechism and heard what I just said, or they have not asked the priest or they just are, have not asked around and they don't know what the Orthodox believe about cremation, or they felt that they couldn't afford anything else and this was the least expensive, and that's what they did. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to hell. I mean, that's I've heard people ask me, does that mean does that mean my my relative is going to hell? No, it doesn't mean that your relative's going to hell. It just means that we can't do the proper, it, it just kind of denies us the proper. Uh, services of of memorial that would otherwise uh, that we could participate in because we can't we can't have koliva for them we can't have the wheat we can't have what we call memorials we can have what's called a trisagion which is a shorter service but it's it takes away from the the more elaborate services that we could otherwise do and obviously if a person does that um, we're we're not allowed to give them. A proper uh, funeral service per se so this is it is an issue um it's it's not been very well resolved we do we do uh, kind of have to understand that cultures that believe in reincarnation generally will cremate cultures that believe in resurrection will not and and that's kind of the issue it's the theological issue that has an effect on our behavior. So if you believe in the resurrection, the body is laid in a tomb or buried in the earth. And of course, nature takes its course, but there are also signs from the bodies of the saints from the early days that refuse to decay. There are stories of, uh, there's like an arm of Mary Magdalene and also an arm of uh, John the Baptist with uh, flesh still on the arm that's soft and malleable. And uh, some say that it's even warm, like, like it had been just severed from someone's body. And there are stories that, um, especially like the hand of St. John the Baptist, it will open and close during times of the year. And when it's closed, I can't remember, I think when it's closed, it's a sign that there will be famine and that uh, crops will be poor. And when it's open, it's a sign that there'll be, uh, there'll be plenty of rain and the crops will be plentiful. Sorry, um, then there's another question. Uh, no, uh, actually worms eating the body, that, that happens by nature. But when you're taking a body and you're putting it into a grinder, that is really a, an act of man that's that's destroying. It's destroying the body. Um, Sometimes, but I, and like I said, some some of the saints, by God's grace, the worms do not eat. The worms do not eat the body. The body does not decay. It's a sign of the body as really having having had in it a a great degree, a greater degree of God's grace such that the body refuses to decay even after death. So that for us is also a sign um, of the sanctity of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the body does decay. Yes, it goes. But actually the bones, the bones are not something that so easily decays. <clears throat> Often in places, especially in Orthodox countries where there's not enough room or cemeteries, uh, bodies are exhumed, and what's left of them, that is, which is the bones. So we have the bones that are left over, and the bones don't really decay like the rest of the flesh does. There are many monasteries, for example, where they will exhume the monk's bones, and they'll write the name of the monk on the forehead, and then they'll put the bones in a, a reliquary or an area where, where other bones of the monks are, 
and you can see them. They've they've decayed and they've they've gone down to the bone and the bones are clean and they're they're kept there as a remembrance of the resurrection. But again, like I said, sometimes they exhume the remains of some of these monks and they find that the bodies have actually refused to decay. Yeah. <clears throat> That question was, so if I understand an Orthodox who may be cremated can have a trisagio, but not a full funeral service. That is, yes, that's true. Um, but unfortunately, like they should, that um, it, it doesn't allow the really the full expression of our faith to, to greet them. We can light candles for them, of course. We can say prayers for the for the people who have passed, and we believe that they see us where they are. But it's really not a good precedence because it's been used in the past to challenge God to say, if if um, as if to say, I don't believe in the resurrection, so let God resurrect these ashes, the, these the, this this powder. Um, a very, a very anti-Christian practice, especially when it was introduced in the Age of Enlightenment. It was generally by those who were agnostics or atheists who did not believe in the resurrection. And that, that's really the crux of it. We, we do not encourage the cremations because it is contrary to the, the faith community and the history of Christians who believe in the resurrection. It rather follows the, the pattern of those faiths like Buddhism and Hinduism that believe in reincarnation and that the body is just a shell after death and that it's, it's to be cast aside as if it's garbage. But God created us, both body and soul. And because God created the body and the soul together, then the, the body is also considered sacred. And that's why we don't defile it. If it's consumed by worms, that's another matter. But we, as human beings, do not take an active role in destroying the body that God had created that is in his image and likeness. So I hope that, that answers that question. I'm going to go on then to the sacraments because I've already gone over an hour and we're going to zip through, or excuse me, not the sacraments, what we believe about eschatology and life after death. Eschatology has to do with the end days. And eschatology, however, it includes much more than that. It includes death. It includes what happens to the soul after death. It includes um, the concept or the orthodox understanding of heaven and hell, if you want to speak of it that way, or foretaste. And it has to do with, of course, what is going to happen close to the Lord's return and at the second coming. So all of that is very important. Now, when we speak specifically of the study of things at the end, which is the Lord's return, the general resurrection, that is generally called teleology from the word, the Greek word telos. And the Greek and this you have to understand this word also. And it, and it, it gives us a better understanding of what we mean by the end of time or the end of the ages. It's not punctiliar. It's not like period, end, over, finished. It, what it means is tel, tel, uh, telos can mean the end, but it can also mean perfection or completion. So it doesn't mean that something ends and that like the end of the world and it's gone and, and there's nothing left. Tele teleology, which is the more proper term from the Greek word telos, means God's completion. His plan for the universe is completed and that everything is as it should have been from the beginning. And this is this is something that my namesake, St. Irenaeus, calls Recapitulate, recapitulation, apokatastasis in Greek. And that is, uh, everything will be as it should have been from the beginning. Now, that's kind of curious. What does that mean exactly? Um, 
we had the discussion a little bit on the possibility and expressing the hope of universal salvation. And indeed, that is uh, a pious uh, belief, a pious hope. But it's not a theology, it's not a dogma in the Orthodox Church. Nevertheless, it is something that we can pray for and that we can hope for, that in the end, whatever, even if it takes eons and epoch, long epochs of time, that eventually the universe will be renewed, transfigured, and transformed. As Saint, in St. John's vision, he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It didn't, it, it didn't mean literally that the old earth and heaven had passed away, although he says that. It means it was like that, meaning that what he's, what we see now in the universe and in the world will be so radically changed in the second coming, in the completion of God's plan, that we won't be able to even recognize it. It will be so transfigured, so changed, it will be unrecognizable. And we will think, hey, this isn't the same. This is a different earth. This is a different heaven. So that was what St. John was saying in the, the Apocalypse, in the, in the book of Revelation. The, of course, uh, Father Cunyaris goes into why we don't know when the end will come and why that wasn't revealed to us in order that, we, that every generation might be prepared, preparing themselves for it. For example, a dignitary is going to visit your house. If you know when he's going to visit your house, you're going to clean up maybe beginning a couple days before he comes so that your house will be clean. But if you don't know when he's coming, come any moment, then you need to keep your house clean at all times. So this is also how we have to look at our own spiritual life. We need to keep our own spiritual house in order. We need to, we need to be, we need to be constantly alert, constantly repentant, constantly um, vigilant, in our uh, life, in our living the Christian way of life. So, again, we don't look, we're not looking at the end of the world, we're looking at its perfection. We don't know when the Lord is coming, so we have to always be striving for that moment. What is heaven and hell? Um, again, heaven and hell are not so much what we read about in Dante's Inferno, but rather a condition of the soul. And sometimes this can be a little bit slippery because we like to fall into the the uh, the visual uh, world of the underworld being with fire and demons and scorpions and some sort different types of vermin attacking the souls of the dead and so forth. But really, it's it's much more tragic. And uh, much, much more sad than that. Hell is an is a true alienation from God. And we can be living in that condition and not know it. That alienation from God is really a life with without knowing what true love is. A materialistic life that really is superficial and in the end, because we've been designed to have a life with God, because we have been designed, all of us, to be spiritual, if we deny that part of our life, we really have no meaning. And we see this in many of the, what we might call the great minds, the great philosophers of atheism. They might write books that make sense and say, hey, wow, this guy was really smart and this is really great. But if you look at their life, their life was dreary and, and really almost disgusting. And in the end, they killed themselves, most of them, because life really didn't have meaning for them. And they really were missing the quintessential thing that makes us human beings. And that is a relationship with God and having God's grace and his energies permeating our life. And when when that doesn't happen, that is hell. Whether you're alive or you're dead, your soul will be in, in torment, in anguish. And people can ignore that. They cannot face it. But, but in the end, 
it is undeniable. And so hell is really this alienation from God. It is not accepting God's love. And it's, it's, it's our fault, really, because God continuously loves us. His love comes down on us. His love reaches out to us. And I would explain, I have explained it like this, much like uh, a teenage child or even a preteen child who's trying to pull away from their parents and they're trying to make their parents angry. And the parent just says, well, that's okay. We love you. We'll support you. It's okay. Everything's all right. We love you so much. And the child gets more angry and more angry and just wants to fight. And like they're burning because they are not accepting the love that their parents are giving them they're rejecting it and when we reject the love that god has for us it becomes like a burning fire and when we accept the same love it becomes a beautiful light and it becomes warmth and it becomes something that is life transcend life changing so that is the difference between heaven and hell. When you accept God's love and you participate in it and you you don't reject it, that is that is the the, the foretaste of heaven. And when you reject it and it, it becomes burning, it becomes like a burning fire to you because you don't want it, but God still loves you and you can't stand that. You want to get away because it it, it will burn you. And so we, we describe that as the fires of hell. Um, Sorry, were there any questions about that? I don't see any other questions. Now, there are a number of, of stories that we have from the, the saints about heaven and hell. And one of them was a story from uh, St. Perpetua and Felicitas. This is from the time of persecution, even before the time when Christianity was legalized uh, in the fourth century. It was during the Roman persecutions. And of course, in Rome, uh, uh, they would not execute a woman who was with child. So there were two women who were friends, and they had both been accused of being Christian. But one of them was found to be with child, and so she was released whereas the other one was kept in her prison. And the one that was in prison had a brother who had died as a catechumen, but had not yet been baptized. And so she had this terrible dream that she uh, saw a beautiful font of water outside, and there was a cave over to the left, and inside the cave, she could hear voices of, of moaning and, and groaning and cries. And she also heard in that cave the voice of her brother. And the other woman came to her, was giving her food. And she told her this dream. And she said to her, pray, pray for your brother's soul. And so she prayed for her brother's soul. And the next night she had a dream and she saw his face coming out of the darkness of the cave, but he couldn't yet get to the fountain. And so the second day, she came to give uh, her friend food, and she confided in her friend, the, the other friend, the story. And she, she told her, continue to pray for your brother. So she continued to pray for her brother, and eventually she saw her brother actually coming out and drinking from the well. So we do believe that there, it is God's will that we all be saved and that there is an efficaciousness of our prayers for those who, who may have wanted to be part of the faith but didn't have the chance. And so God in his mercy listens to the prayers of the faithful and the prayers of the saints. It doesn't mean, as in Luther's uh, objection to the indulgences, that if I give a million dollars to the church in Mexico City and build a monastery that I can get an indulgence for 10 generations of my descendants and they won't go to purgatory, they'll go straight to heaven when they die. That is not something that the church ever accepted, and that's not the purpose of 
the story of Saints Perpetua and Felicitas. They, the, the story here is that, yes, there is an effect. There can be a positive effect on the prayers of the living for those who have passed. One such example, again, is from the Pope Hadrian. Pope Hadrian knew about Emperor Trajan. Emperor Trajan was not a Christian, but Emperor Trajan was against the persecution of, of Christians in the Roman Empire. This is when, again, before Christianity became the national religion. Emperor Trajan told his people, do not persecute the Christians for their religious beliefs. If they commit a crime, if they kill somebody, if they steal something, if they, if they do uh, damage to someone's home, something like that, yes, then they've committed a civil crime, then you punish them according to civil law. But do not punish these people for their religious beliefs. So he had compassion for the Christians. Later, centuries after his death, uh, Emperor Hadrian um, was praying for Emperor Trajan <laughs> because he he liked him. He felt, hey, this man was, was good to the Christians. Why shouldn't we be praying for his soul? And so he prayed and he had his name in all the services of the church in, in Rome and Eventually, an angel appeared to him and said, Man of God, your prayers have been heard for Emperor Trajan. You need not pray for him anymore. His soul is in the hand of God. But don't do that again. So I don't know what to make of that. But he, he prayed, he prayed, Emperor Trajan somehow was improved because of his, because of his humanity. He somehow... His, the condition of his soul was improved wherever it was, but the angel told Hadrian not to do that. So this, this again, is a story from the early church about um, the efficaciousness of prayers for the dead. St. Anthony was also, uh, who was a monastic saint from Egypt, uh, was walking through the desert one day and he came upon a skull. And he took his stick and he tapped the skull and he said, who were you? And the voice of the soul of the man whose skull it was uh, said from beneath the earth, um, I was a priest of the ancient gods. And he said, where are you now? And he says, I'm in a place of utter darkness. And Anthony said, well, is there anything I can do for you? And the, the, the soul of the man from of the skull said, well, we can't, we're, we're so alone, we can't see each, uh, at each other, but if a, a righteous person prays for us, we get glimpses of others around us. So even though that didn't say that he could save the man's soul from, from languish, it did, it, it, the prayers for, for those who have died were refreshed by it, let's say, temporarily refreshed by it. There was one other story. Um, sorry. Slipped out of my mind. Um, but there is a belief that this, 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 so, okay, I, that's it. Um, in the Jewish faith, in the account of the Hanukkah uh, history, which we have in our Bible at, in First and Second Maccabees, there was a battle where a number of Jewish soldiers had died, and money was gathered to take to the temple to give to the priests, and a list of the names of all the souls who had died was given for the priests to pray for the dead. And this is actually a very old Jewish practice. In fact, one of the months of the year called Elul was dedicated to remembering the dead. Even though their, their funeral services are very brief, there's a few prayers and the burial of the body, and that's it because of the unclean, they, they believe that the dead bodies are, are unclean, quote unquote, from the, from the Mosaic law. 
Nevertheless, there is a month of the year where uh, Jewish people will pray for their dead. It is not something that was unknown to Judaism. It was not something that was unknown because the Maccabees were before Christ. So it was not something that was unknown to Christ and the apostles. And so we have, even from this early tradition of the church, a time to pray for the dead. We have what's called Saturdays of Souls. So we do believe that um, we should pray for the dead. It doesn't mean that we're going to change God's judgment on them. When we pray for the dead, we believe that they they can participate in our love for them again. They feel our love for, for them, and, and they see and they hear our prayers for them, and it gives them relief. It gives them a sense that we're talking to them again or that we are with them again, okay, so that there is that bond of love that we have with our family and our friends that have passed on from this life is not broken in death. So we have to understand that from an Orthodox perspective. Um, again, that somewhat gives us an under, uh, uh, also uh, an underlying uh, belief of our, our approach to the saints. Sorry, I thought there was another question. No. Okay. So what we believe about the sacraments. I'm going to be very brief about this, so I apologize for going over it yet again. But what we believe about the sacraments, often we fall into the trap of trying to be like the Catholic Church. And we say that there are seven sacraments, and we they're somewhat similar to the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. And then uh, Father Cognaris also points out that there are yet other sacraments and then there are things that were called sacramentals which are which might be like uh, smaller things but i have to object to that because saint john christum said let's say you're going to the church and you're prepared for holy communion and you see someone on the side of the road like like the uh the story like in the story of the good samaritan and you stop and you help this person and maybe you've saved their lives, maybe you haven't, but but you at least have stopped and you have ministered to someone in need, but you've missed Holy Communion. You don't get to church in time, or maybe you can't get to church because you've stopped to help this person. You have received, you have received the same grace that you would have received in Holy Communion itself. That's big. Because Holy Communion in, in the sacraments of the church is, is huge. It's like the, the most intimate uh, reception of Christ into us, okay, through Holy Communion. So if that is equal to helping someone in need, then that's a very profound. That means helping someone in need is a sacrament equal to Holy Communion. Now, if I can go on to say... Everything that we do in life can either be a sacrament or a sin. And I'll get it to what sin means. Sin actually means missing the target. It means an imperfection. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're a bad person or that necessarily that you have done a bad thing. Sometimes you do things unintentionally and you hurt other people unintentionally. So that also is a sin. Okay, missing because sin literally in Greek is amartia, meaning you've you've missed the target. You've you've drawn the arrow, you've released it from the bow, and the arrow misses the target entirely. It's way off. That is sin, and it 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 has to do with our imperfections and our in, and our imperfect relationship with God again. But be that as it may, we can divide what we do in life into sacrament and sin. Reading the Bible is not listed among the seven sacraments, and yet if you gain great grace from it. You learn about the teachings of Christ. You will learn about the will of God. When you pray, how can that not be a sacrament? You're participating in God's invisible grace when you pray. When you go to the services of the church, you are participating in God's 
invisible grace. That's what sacrament means. A sacrament is a visible way through which we participate in God's invisible grace. But ultimately, and this is this is the interesting thing, is that ultimately we as Orthodox do not look at the church as an institution. The church is the sacrament. The church is the vehicle of God's grace imparted to the faithful. And that sacrament has institutions like baptism and chrismation and confession and communion and unction and marriage and ordination and all the other things. So what we do when we when we do things for other people and we do it in the name of Christ, we're doing it for, in other words, as members of the body of church, not as individuals. We can do something outside the church uh, that's good. But what does that mean? That means that we've done it for ourselves. We've not done it for necessarily for Christ. We haven't done it on behalf of the church, which is the body of Christ. You see what I mean? But we've done it for ourselves because it makes us feel good, because we want others to, to look at us as, as higher people, as, as good people, something like that. That's not right. That's why we do things in the church, for the church, and in the name of Christ. And that, that becomes sacrament. Okay, the church is the sacrament and we have institutions within that sacrament. And that's why it's very difficult for people outside the Orthodox Church to really grasp what the Orthodox Church is. There was a Protestant, um, I think he had a, a Bible Institute. His name was Hank Hanegraaff. You can look him up. I actually, uh, I heard from him personally when I went to New York this last week uh, at the clergy retreat. Monday through uh, Wednesday, and he was formerly a Protestant. I mean, now he's Orthodox, and he talks about the sacraments as, as indispensable uh, for any Christian. <laughs> it's very funny because you wouldn't expect that, but he is a convert and has very, a great zeal for Orthodox Christianity. And the people, when he converted to Orthodox Christianity, they said he had left Christianity. And many of his critics were saying things that, that were condemning his beliefs, but these beliefs were not Orthodox beliefs. They were Roman Catholic beliefs. So they don't really make a distinction between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Actually, Catholicism and Protestantism are much more close, like fingers on the same hand. Orthodoxy is a different hand altogether because the church is not an institution as the Catholic and Protestant churches are. The church is the sacrament it is transcendent. It is the community of the Holy Trinity. It is eternal. And what we have in the church that the Western church calls sacraments are actually institutes of the church. So this is a radically different approach and a different way of looking at the church and sacraments. And this is, this is the Orthodox approach. When I learned that, I was flabbergasted. I was I was really shocked. It was something that was very refreshing, something that really rang of the truth, and something that really, um, for me, was a growing experience. Anyway, we go through the sacraments real quickly. Um, we become Orthodox through baptism. This is a passage, a rite of passage, through which we die with Christ on the cross and are buried with him and are raised with him. So we have that death and resurrection, that spiritual transformation in the baptism, ideally. Now, that does take place. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, but we have to be able to stoke that fire rather than putting the ashes of sin over it and letting it smolder and be almost dead in us. Saint, uh, excuse me, say, uh, I think it was St. John. Uh, I can't remember one of the apostles, one of the, the maybe it was Peter, uh, one of the apostles baptized Simon the magician. If you recall from the Acts of the Apostles, Simon the magician was not a, a true Christian in his heart. He received, according to the the, uh, the understood the interpretation of the fathers of the church, he received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he tried to use them 
for his own aggrandizement. And because of his arrogance, he failed to stoke the fires of the Holy Spirit that were planted in him. And he did not manifest the glory of God. He only manifested his own glory, which is arrogance. He didn't have the humility to, to actually make good the gifts that he received in baptism. After, uh, after baptism is, of course, chrismation. We, we do both at the same time. Uh, in the old days, there may have been a period before, chrisma before chrismation occurred, but it was very short <laughs> because chrismation is actually the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit that we receive in baptism. So it's necessary to one to follow the other. Excuse me. So the baptism is a rite of entry and membership into the church, a type of adoption. We become adopted as children of God through baptism. There's a number of things that happen, a threefold immersion in the water, anointing with oil, which represents the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life that makes us slippery to the clutches of the devil. There's a tonsuring, a cutting of the hair, which was a secular sign of adoption. People who were adopted in the old days in the Roman world, they had their heads shaved from here on back and down. So the back of their head was bald, and then they had the top of their head, and only had like tufts of hair on the side here. <clears throat> and then as an adult, people knew, hey, that person was adopted as an adult. So they knew it was a sign of adoption. We only cut a little bit of the hair uh, on the four, four sides, the front, the back, and either side, we just cut a little bit of hair. So those of you who are going to be chrismated, don't, don't be scared. We're not going to shave your head. There is all the, the, In the uh, chrismation, there is, a, a, as I said, a seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The oil with which you are anointed with the chrismation dates back to the apostles themselves. The apostles made the oil for the first uh, Christians of the church. And when that oil runs down, we add new ingredients to it. So even though it might be extremely diluted, it is nevertheless oil that was originally consecrated by the apostles and has been prayed over uh, over each generation by those who have added to it and mixed it and and brought it together. Ours goes back uh, traditionally to the Apostle Andrew in Constantinople, where we get it from the Patriarchate. Patriarchate of Constantinople, now his temple. Confession then, um, again, we confess, but when we go to confession, it's not merely saying the things that we've done that were wrong or what we failed to do that were right. It's also going to the priest and getting an idea of what we can do in our daily life, in our daily routines that will be spiritually healthy for us. And sometimes that goes hand in hand what's, with what's uh, physically healthy as well. For example, uh, I tell people you need to have regular sleep. You need to have regular sleep hours. If you don't have regular sleep hours, then generally, if you don't sleep enough, especially, you're not going to be able to control your emotions and emotions are the opposite of logic okay so logic will go out the door and your emotions will take over and you can't do much with that and it's very difficult to have a prayerful life if you don't have enough sleep or if you don't have the right sleep patterns okay because again it affects emotion and logic you have to be you have to be what's called in greek isikos you have to be quiet and still in your soul in order to pray. Okay, so confession has to do with uh, how. If, I, if we... I may ask a question. Yes. For for people in professions where sleeping is a bit difficult, such as my own, how would we go and about mine, that? Yes. Yes, and yours as well. You do the best you can, because routine, and again, um, routine is very important for your physical health, but it's also important for your spiritual health. So if you have time when you first wake up to say a prayer, 
And when you have time before you go to sleep to say a prayer every day, as long as you can keep it up, okay, that will be healthy for you spiritually. Okay. That's the kind of thing that you discuss in your confession. And if you okay. can do it, if you can't do it, what you would do instead of that sort of thing, those are the kind of things that you would talk about with a priest in confession. Okay, your right. daily routine. Do you pray before you eat? Do you ask God to bless the food before you eat it? Do you give thanks to God after you eat? Okay, those are all important things. I didn't know. When I first became an Orthodox, I was just really green. And and I had some issues with anger and, you know, road rage, that sort of thing. And the priest asked me, after, after my confession, he asked me, do you pray before you eat? And I hadn't thought of it. I, well, you know, Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving, we pray as a family before we eat, but not, not generally, not every day. And he said, well, pray before you eat. And it was like, shocked me, like, what, really? And it makes sense. I mean, you should, right. But I just didn't think of it. Okay. And I started to do that. And he, I did notice a change. I didn't, yeah, that, that helped me a lot. So sometimes we fall into certain patterns of behavior, sins, if you want to call them that. And there has to be a reason. So you go to the confession and you ask, well, you know, I'm doing this. What's going on? And I might have to ask you, well, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, do the people around you use foul language? If that's your, if that's your case, because if you know what you hear, if it goes in your ear enough, it's going to start coming out your mouth. Okay, so those are the kind of things. What kind of environment are you exposed to? Uh, what kind of routine do you have uh, during the day? That sort of thing is very important, not just for the physical, but for the spiritual well-being. And it has to do with fasting as well. That's why we have fasting. And fasting cannot just be a diet. Okay, some people say, well, I keep the fast. I don't, I do, do by, by the rules. Yeah, the act, exact rules. Well, do you pray? Do you go to church? No, no, I don't do that. Well, how, how is the fast going to help you? The fast is there so that you can increase your prayer life. That's the purpose of the fast. Okay, you're not eating cooked food because you're not taking time to cook your food. Therefore, you have more time to pray. Are you praying? Okay, so... The two go together. And, and that's that's the kind of thing I have to ask people if people don't ask themselves that. And that's the kind of thing that's discussed in a confession. OK, it's not coming me coming down on you like a hammer. You're a bad person. You did this and you have to go through this penance. OK, sometimes there are things that are that sound like that, but they're not. There shouldn't be a penance in the Orthodox faith. It should be an exercise to make yourself stronger, so to make yourself more healthy so that you can resist this sin, so that with God's help, you, you don't fall into that trap again and again and again. So going to confession, you are, by the way, confessing to God. The mm -hmm. priest stands there to give advice, okay, spiritual advice. So that's what's going on, basically. Um, and the advice that I give should not be taken as penance. It should be taken as medicine or as uh, a weight trainer telling you what kind of exercise you should do. And maybe you've done too much. Maybe I have to tell you, hey, back off. You're burning out. You know, we don't want to go too, too, too much into it. So that, yeah. that all has to do with confession. And I hope you have a little, now a, a little bit of a wider understanding of confession. It's not that you go and you say, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I've done A, B, C, and D. And then I say, say, say so many Hail Marys and so many are our fathers, and that's it. No, that's not what we're doing. We're we're doing some serious discussion of your spiritual health and what uh, what what advice I can give you so that you can improve. That's the point of confession. And that God and that God forgives you, of course, in the end. But but in the but in that process, it's for your benefit, not for your torment. Okay, but for your benefit. Understood. Thank you. Oh, certainly. Now, communion, of course, is was instituted by many of these things were instituted by Christ Himself in the Holy Scripture. If not Christ, then the apostles. Uh, communion is one of them, where He says, "Take, eat. This is my body. Take, drink. This is my blood." 
There are many things that can be discussed within that, but this is what we call sacramental language. So it was probably, the gospel was probably written after the practice of, or the, the sacrament of Holy Communion was well known among Christians, so that when it was repeated here in the gospel account, people were familiar with it. They knew the words already. But in a sense, um, communion is also that medicine. And I think St. Ignatius of Antioch from the very early church calls it the medicine of immortality. It is a means by which we renew our relationship with Christ again and again, but it is something that we need to be really well prepared for when we receive. And that is why I, if uh, someone is not an Orthodox Christian, I do not give them communion. Why? Because, because I think I'm better than them? No, that's not what I'm saying. Paul said people have received the gifts, and some of them, because they were not prepared, have become sick and have even died. Okay, so communion is a very serious thing. And if I know someone of my parishioners have approached the communion and they've done something that's not serious or something that's not spiritually right, then I can say to them, you know, we need to talk first. We need, you can't, I, I can't give you a communion. We need, we need to talk first. I wouldn't say it out loud, but it's whispered to them. Okay. Because it's not supposed to demean someone or, or insult them when, when you're saying you can't take communion. Okay. It's, it's because you're not ready. Okay. And many of our own people will not come forward to communion because they know they're not ready. They haven't prepared. Okay. And that includes fasting. It includes prayer and it includes confession. So if a person comes who is not an Orthodox Christian, I know they've not done any, any of them. They've probably not done any of those because only the Orthodox Church really has the fast nowadays. Uh, I think the Catholic Church, you, you don't, you, they say don't eat anything an hour before you receive communion, some, something like that. For us, it's like midnight before, like don't eat or drink water, not even water, okay, unless you have health problems. There are some dispensations, of course. But like, we're very serious, okay? And Wednesday, Friday fast, generally during the year, and this period, the, the period of Lent, very strict fast, we should be serious. Now, if our own people are eating meat and cheese and, and, such, and such that that they know they should, then they should not be coming to communion. Because as Paul said, you can become sick and even die by receiving unworthily, okay? That is from, that is from I think, First Corinthians, maybe second, I can't remember, one of the chapter 13s. Um, anyway, so if I care about the wellness of your soul and your well-being, and I know you're not an Orthodox Christian, then I will say, that's the reason why I say I can't give you Holy Communion, because you could become sick or die. If I didn't care, here, go ahead, eat it, drop dead. That's, that's totally against the humility and the love that I have learned from Holy Scripture, from the traditions of the church, from Christ himself, okay? So that is why we deny communion to people, not because we think that we are more worthy than them, but because they need to be ready. And if they're not ready, something bad might happen, and we don't want that. So out of humility, out of love for other people, that's the reason why we don't commune people who are not orthodox or who are not ready, okay? Um, the other sacraments are marriage and ordination, which are very much alike. Uh, marriage is a sacred thing to us, just as um, the proper and healthy sexual inter uh, relationship between husband and wife are is a holy thing. Okay, people might snicker at that because in the West we've consider that to be something that's taboo and dirty, like I said earlier. But the orthodoxy does not consider that to be taboo and dirty. It's something that's sacred. And that is why, that is the reason why it should only be between a husband and wife. Okay, that's why we stick to that. Now, that means that marriage is a sacred union. And why do we, why do we emphasize that? Because that's what the Bible says. In fact, the church the church's relationship to God is described as 
husband to wife. God to church is husband to wife, okay? Or Christ in the church, husband to wife. The kingdom of heaven is often described as a marriage banquet. So it tells you that the, the symbol of marriage is very central and very important to the Christian faith because it speaks to us of those subjects of which I spoke before, like eschatology, of our relationship with God and with the life to come, with the kingdom of heaven, that loving relationship. We, we might scratch our heads and ask, why, was, why did God create Adam alone? Why didn't he just create Adam and Eve together at the beginning? And that was to teach us that, hey, our true spouse is God. I mean, not in the physical sense, but I mean, the spiritual relationship that we have is that selfless love that we should have for our spouse. That's the, that's the love God has for us. OK, it's intense. It's, it's selfless. It's sacrificial. Paul says Paul says to the husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. OK, Christ loved the church so much. He was, went through persecution and torture and death on the cross. That's how much he loved the church. That's how much a husband is called to love his wife. That's how much God loves us and the church. Okay? So that really intense, sacred relationship of marriage on a certain level is also the relationship that we should have with God. And marriage teaches us that. The experience of marriage teaches us that. Now, monastics, obviously, they don't have that relationship. But in, in essence, uh, one who is monastic is actually married to the monastery. Okay? And we call even, even, even as in the Catholic Church, we would call a nun a bride of Christ, in a sense. So even that monastic, uh, even the monastic life is somewhat com comparable to a married life, okay? And people are called, all people, whether they're married or not, are called to that selfless, sacrificial love for the other, for the other, hum other human beings, and for God. So when we look at the sacrament of marriage, we don't just skim over it, okay? Like, like the sacrament of communion, which is that intimate bringing of Christ into our bodies, so too, the sacrament of marriage is something that is very profound. That's why the, the service, the marriage service, looks very much like the divine liturgy in which Holy Communion is received. It's very similar, the, the elements of it. Now, there are also those that are called to a higher service, that is to say, to the priesthood, okay, which includes deacons, priests, and bishops, generally speaking. Now, we have to understand that within the context of what Christ said about the leadership of the church. He said, if you would be great among your brethren, you must become their servant. The servant of all is the greatest. And so when we look at the, the sacrament of ordination to the priesthood, to the diaconate, to, uh, to being a, a bishop, that is a... That is actually one of leadership, but of service. We are the servants. Okay, we and we have to we have to understand as Christ came into the world as our leader, he was also very humble, and we have to emulate that humility of Christ. And again, that leads us back to the same, the same thing that the other sacraments lead us into. That, that sense of love, selfless love and service to others and to God. And with that, I will I will end for the for the subjects today. If there's anyone who has any questions about the reading or what I said, please ask now and then we will conclude. Okay, you can unmute or you can type. All right. Good evening, Father, again. Thank yes, you so evening. much once again for your sure. um uh, lecture. This is another very informative lecture. Um, so I have two questions this time. Okay. Um, the first one is, what is the church's view of birth control within marriage? Mm -hmm. 
You want to ask both or you want me to answer each? Okay, I, I can answer well, one. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I can answer. Do you want me to answer or ask? Okay. Okay. Birth control. Um, we don't, obviously we are opposed to abortion. Um, beca because, and this is one of the questions that, that often comes up outside the church, but why are, why is the church opposed to abortion? Um, because we see even in the example of St. John the Baptist, that before he was born, he recognized the presence of Christ and he danced in his mother's womb. So it says in, in scripture, in the gospels. So taking that as an example, we know that the soul is there and, and we should not abort. Um, now, when we, when we approach that issue, it's very important to understand the historical context and the reason why people insist at least that abortion be a right. And that is because women's rights have been abused and that things have gone too extreme in the other direction. What do I mean by that? Well, we have to give some sort of, insurance of, of uh, assurance that we're not going to abrogate the right of a woman for the sake of her child, as if the child has more rights than the mother. Meaning that the government can say, well, it's going to be against the law for mothers to smoke with, their, with the child is in the womb or while they're breastfeeding. And it's going to be against the law for them to drink alcohol. And they have to have a certain amount of sleep. And they have to have a certain amount of exercise. Well, why don't we just incarcerate them until the baby is, is weaned? You know what I mean? That's just, that's too extreme. That is way too extreme. And so we have to understand those kind of fears when we go into a discussion about abortion. Okay, we need to be balanced. Okay, we can't just say, oh, you're murdering a baby. You know, we're, we're not talking about just the child. We're talking about the rights of the mother. And there are there should be rights there. Those should be discussed. So when we talk about abortion, it's it's a very it's I know it's a very volatile thing. But unfortunately, people on both sides are, are so narrow minded that they close their ears and do not listen to logic. Both sides, both sides. And they just have this force and they're going at it like. Like two rocks hitting each other, and they're not they're not listening. They're not compromising. They're not they're not recognizing and appreciating uh, the fears and the rights that might be abrogated by one side or the other. Okay, so that I wanted to say on the first hand, that's why Orthodox Christians do not really overly get involved in those kind of protests. A because we believe. It should not be. It should not be a law, okay? One law or another, because law is not going to stop anyone, okay? It needs to be education. What are we doing? Why are people? Why are women? Why do they feel so desperate that they are going to abort their babies? Why is that? Because there is a desperation there. We need to answer that. Is it economic? Is it social? What is it? We need to take care of the fear of what's going on when Justinian. And Theodora were emperor and empress of Constantinople. Conditions in the city and in the empire, in that part of the empire, were so bad that people were putting pitch in their babies' noses after they were born and throwing them into the Bosporus, and drown they were drowning their babies. But it was a desperation. It was a thing of desperation. And they asked, they, they saw, they would look down from the from the palace onto the water and they would see dead babies floating in the water. What's going on here? No one would tell them what's going on. No one would tell them why. Okay. What happened is people, people did not have enough food to feed their families. And so they had to sacrifice some of their children. Some of them were selling their children into prostitution. And that made a lot of ba unwanted babies that mothers couldn't take care of because they were prostitutes forced into this situation because of, of the socioeconomic thing that was going on. And so they were doing the same thing. So what did they do to stop this terrible thing from happening? Well, he understood 
people needed food. So he apportioned food from different parts of the empire, brought it into the city so that people could have enough food for their families. He took the, the empress herself built an extension to the palace so that any woman that wanted to get off the street and escape prostitution would have royal protection. They could come in, into the, they could live in the royal palace with the oversight of the empress. They could learn things to, to survive, textiles, whatever they can do, you know, whatever skill that they would have, they could develop and they could sell their wares and make a living and, 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 support themselves and not be forced into prostitution. And they did all these wonderful things and social reform. And what happened? People stopped killing their babies. So that is the orthodox approach. Take care of the problem. Don't just make a law that's very draconian and threatening to people. We got to take care of, of the problem. Okay. Now, if it doesn't, we understand that some people are sterile. Does that mean they have to be celibate? No, because again, sexuality actually builds a, an intimacy between husband and wife. Okay, so that act is not unhealthy or unwholesome. And if there are health problems or financial issues that they can't have children, then you know, contraceptive is is fine as long as we're not an, an abortive con contraception. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's fine. People can still engage in that. Husbands and wives still engage in that. They should, okay, because that's what a husband and wife, that's their relationship. That's part of their, and again, it's a sacred, it's still a sacred, considered a sacred thing. Okay, so um, if people are choosing not to have children because of selfishness, then the church might say, hey, you know, you should reconsider because we should not be acting out of selfishness, okay? When husband and wife uh, have intercourse, it should not be uh, using the other person for their own pleasure. It shouldn't be a selfish thing. This is the shared thing uh, that two people do together, a shared, a shared pleasure, uh, a shared thing. It should not be abusive, okay? Uh, the other person should not be a tool for the other person's pleasure, you know? Uh, I enjoyed you. Now I get rid of you. Something like that. It's that that would be an, a, an aber aberration of of sexual intercourse. Okay, for from an orthodox perspective. Okay, it it should be done within a loving way and a, a mutually acceptable way. But it should not be abusive and it should not be degrading to one person or the other. Okay, so that that is our approach. Um, on what sexuality in general and also on contraceptives, if that answers your question, your first question. Okay. Okay. And your second? My second question is, so uh, is somebody allowed to, to be baptized if they still have questions regarding like anything related to faith or God or anything like that? If you accept the basic things of, you know, the basic beliefs of the Orthodox Church, what you hear here and those opinions, then there's nothing to to prevent you from being Orthodox. But I mean, it, it's always and I don't I don't don't take me wrong with this. I mean, it's always healthy to have a little doubt because that means you have you have to have faith. Um, if you don't have any. If you don't have any doubt in something at all, then it's not a matter of faith. It's just a matter of knowledge. And, and our faith is a, a matter of faith, not knowledge. Okay, so I would say everyone, I would hope that everyone in, in of the Orthodox faith does have some sort of doubt because it, it, would, it, would, it would mean very little. Our faith would mean very little if, if it wasn't, if it was just assurance of knowledge. Okay, if does that make sense? Okay, so for example, what makes the martyrs uh, heroic? Uh, if they knew, and they they knew for sure that that they're going to heaven, and that that God will take them in his in his care, and that they will have eternal bliss by going through martyrdom, then they're not as brave. They're not as brave as those who say, "Well, this might not happen." This might not happen, but I'm going to choose to believe that my future is with Christ 
and not in this world and go through it. That would be bravery. That would be true bravery because they don't really know if they're going to receive the prize. And many saints have said that even in their even in their torture and martyrdom. You know, they'll say, you know, the Lord promised this, but, you know, I am a sinner and I am still not worthy, even if I die. But I know that I'm dying for what's right, but I might not receive the prize, but I know I'm dying for what's right. And with that doubt, that makes them even more courageous, in my opinion, than than those who had no doubts at all. OK. Thank you so much. Mm, certainly. Any other questions? Wow, it's nine o'clock already. No. Okay. So shall we shall we finish in prayer? Yes, sir. Okay. Now let your servants depart in peace, O Master, according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And God willing, we will see you next week for catechism. Um, for those of you who are interested not in the Bible week, class, Lord. unfortunately. Go ahead, Dr. Sanders. Sorry. Not, not next week. Don't forget we have the Christian Council thing on Tuesday. Oh, and that's, that's why I was saying uh, the Bible class right. next Tuesday oh. will, will, will not be held. Um, next Thursday, we will have the catechism. But next Tuesday, we we have a, we, unfortunately, we had a conflict. For, for those of you who are interested in the Bible class, that will have to be postponed until the following Tuesday. And then we'll have we'll, – and, of course, we'll, God willing, we're going to be having Bible classes on all the Tuesdays following. Um, and I believe we have three more. Three more classes of the catechism, and that will conclude uh, our catechism class for Thursday evenings. Okay? So thank you, everyone. God bless. And those of you who can come to church, we'll see you there. Good night. Good night, Father. Good, Good night. night, everyone. Good night, everyone.